Hello, everybody. My name is Pablo Boczkowski. I'm a faculty member at Northwestern University and the director of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you so much for joining us for today's weekly virtual seminar of the Center. It is really a pleasure to have you with us. The mission of the Center is to create knowledge about digital media in Latinx and Latin American communities across the Americas. Today's speaker is a leading scholar in this space. Isabella Wad is an associate professor at Erasmus University's Media and Communication Department in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. Facundo Suenzo, a doctoral student at Northwestern University and graduate affiliate of the Center for Latinx Digital Media, will introduce Isabel in just a minute. I am delighted to note that this quarter, our series is co-sponsored by the Alice Kaplan Institute for the Humanities, the Buffett Institute for Global Affairs, the Center for Global Cultural Communication, the Department of Communication Studies, the Department of Radio, Television and Film, and the Program in Latin American and Caribbean Studies. But before we go to the seminar, I would like to start by acknowledging that Northwestern is a community of learners situated within a network of historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. It is also in close proximity to an urban Native American community in Chicago and near several tribes in the Midwest. The Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Three Fires, the Jewe, Potawatomi, and Orawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho Chunk Nations. It was also a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other Native tribes, and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. It is within Northwestern's responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about Native peoples and institutions history with them. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity and inclusion, Northwestern works towards building relationships with Native American communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, community service, and their government efforts. Let me say briefly a little bit more about how the seminar will unfold. First, Facundo will tell us more about uh, Isabel's research and career in just a couple of minutes. Then Isabel will present her work. <coughs> Excuse me. After that, we will open for questions. Please enter your questions in the Q&A function of the webinar at the bottom of the screen at any point in time in the seminar. After Isabel delivers her remarks, we will open up for that and Facundo will moderate your questions. At the end, we will deliver some closing remarks. Once again, many thanks for joining us. And without further ado, Facundo, the screen is all yours. Thank you very much, Pablo, and hello, everyone. I'm truly honored to have been invited uh, to today's seminar to introduce Professor Isabel Awad and moderate this presentation at the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Dr. Isabel Awad is Associate Professor in the Department of Media and Communication at the Erasmus School of History, Culture and Communication, Erasmus University, Rotterdam, where she's the theme lead on diversity and inclusion within the Vital Cities and Citizens Erasmus Initiative. Dr. Awad obtained her PhD in communication from Stanford University in 2007. She received her licenciatura in journalism and a master in aesthetics, both from the Universidad Católica de Chile. Before moving to the US and to Europe, uh, she worked as a journalism lecturer in Universidad Católica and as a political reporter in a national Chilean newspaper. Dr. Awad has authored several book chapters and an extensive selection of journalism, journal articles in prestigious venues such as Journalism of Communication, Journalism Studies, European Journal of Communication, and Cuadernos Info, among others. Both her research and teaching are motivated by understanding of the condition of democratic communication and social justice against a backdrop of social inequality. Along these lines, much of her inspiring work focuses on how the media and the news particularly contribute to the inclusion and the exclusion of marginalized social groups and on the efforts of specific actors to navigate creatively within hegemonic media environments. The title of today's presentation is Social Justice in and Through Communication, Taking Actors Seriously. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Isabel Awad. Thank you, Facundo. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Facundo. Uh, thanks, Pablo. Thanks, everyone here. I don't know, in your lunchtime, in your dinner time, I don't know when you are joining. Uh, thank you, Mora, as well, who has been 
um, in close contact with me to make sure things go, work well. Um, preparing this presentation or preparing to prepare this presentation has involved quite some self-reflection on my part. And I apologize already for bothering you a little bit with this, hopefully not that much, uh, which is a somehow pretty self-centered exercise with which I start. So the first thing was that um, listening to others in this platform has forced me to ask myself whether and how I fit here. Not just because of the great work others have discussed in this series, so not just because of the usual imposter syndrome symptoms, but also because this space is frequently used to present larger lines of inquiry or maybe some um, more um, specific projects, but always from the perspective of a Latin American scholar. For the first time in my career, as far as I remember, I have seriously asked myself, am I a Latin American scholar? And what does it mean to be a Latin American scholar? Very specifically, how does one claim that position, and forgive me for the repetition, from such a privileged position as mine? Limiting my example only to the institutions involved in my academic trajectory, most of them outside Latin America, by the way, what does it mean to be a Latin American scholar with a BA in journalism from Universidad Católica de Chile, which I obtained there in the mid 1990s and the time may be important to understand yeah, the sort of rather elitist space this was with a PhD from Stanford University and the rest of my career at large universities in the Netherlands. The answer would be less complicated if I was really an expert on Latin American topics, but I'm not. I hope not to disappoint you too much about this. And yet, I think um, I find a possibility of an answer to this question about how am I a Latin American scholar by exploring the Latinx seminar presentations and the journeys and yeah, the amazing encyclopedia or, or compendium that um, this series uh, is putting together. As I dug deeper um, into what I wanted to share with you today in relation to what has been said in seminars before, I realized that discussions about communication and social justice were so common in this platform, are so common in this platform, that, and yet here I ran into yet another problem, my contribution could simply be redundant. I started wondering, and I, this is a question I would like to pose to the organizers and experts in this series. I started wondering whether the preoccupation with issues of social justice is one of the central features, even if not exclusively, of course, of Latin American communication research. And this, I assume, has to do with the shameless inequalities in our region. So one may experience those inequalities from different positions. In my case, it has been with growing awareness of the privileges around me, not just around me locally, where I am now, but around me in the local and transnational spaces of everyday experiences in my personal history, etc. And this awareness triggers a messy bag of feelings, which of course include guilt, shame, anger, but also a sense of responsibility and a drive, never fully successful, to explore and try to go beyond one's privilege and one's blind spots. The only way to do that is by trying to look at things um, from the perspective of people in different positions. So, the challenge is not to assume what's going on, right? Well, we are researchers, we never do that. But to go and talk with people, I think. Not just talk with people, but go and talk with people, right? Um, methodologically, but also epistemologically, I think, this implies adopting an ethnographic approach. This approach, as announced in the abstract, involves taking actors seriously actors involved in the processes we are studying. What is not explicit in the abstract, but I think it won't surprise anyone here, 
is the importance of understanding those actors, those actors' views and experiences in relation to structures of power that do not determine them, but inevitably share their possibilities, shape their possibilities, sorry. Taking these structures seriously also implies going beyond the good intentions of those involved in practices of representation, especially when those are uh, um, uh, speaking from or representing from positions of power, and this includes myself, other scholars and media professionals most, most commonly. Now, to be clear, I don't mean to suggest that an ethnographic approach is unique or even original. We uh, date uh, the ethnographic turn in media studies to the 90s and 70s, um, mostly in relation to audiences, but since then much and brilliant scholarship has been um, done and extended to other spheres of research. And the people who organize and who have um, uh, participated in this seminar uh, yeah, offer um, convincing evidence of this or the work of these people. And yet, even though it's not super original, um, talking, taking actors seriously um, continues to be productive and to lead to original insights. That's, that's what I want to argue today. Um, I will use some examples from my own research to show, yeah, what or to, yeah, add to what we know about um, what this uh, approach has to offer, uh, and specifically in relation to understanding the relations and possibilities between communication and social justice. Um, until now, I had mostly attributed my fascination with ethnography to the anthropology courses I sort of infiltrated in uh, during graduate school. But um, I must say that, yeah, Thinking about this presentation, I realized that uh, my position as a Latin American scholar, um, my specific position within that um, broader position, if you want, may also be part of this. But okay, let me. I'm sorry. Thanks for your patience, and I will uh, patience, and I will turn now into research. Uh, my plan. I will share my screen. Um, Okay, so, uh, so I will focus on three areas of research, um, which are those that I have placed um, on the left column. Um, and what I will do for each of them is that I will try to bring you back to how I found the field, the state of the art I'm calling it, it's maybe a too pretentious of a name, but what was happening in the field, in the world, but also in academic discussions about the topic at the time when I worked on the project, what the project was about and what kind of um, taking actor, actor seriously uh, was involved in the project and how that enabled specific findings and contributions. And I will start back in the days with the work I uh, conducted for my um, dissertation. Um, the title of my dissertation was Journalism, Multiculturalism and the Politics of Representation, the case of the Latina O community in San Jose, California. Um, I'm tempted here actually to take a detour to discuss the AO ending um, versus the X ending, which is used in the name of this series, which is a conversation I really love. And um, maybe we have time to discuss it later. For now, and in a way to address that, uh, let me just in uh, yeah, insist on the fact that this was research that I conducted yeah, 18 years ago. Um, so yeah, that's where we need to place also the name of the of the dissertation. Uh, and by journalism and diversity policy as something like a field and trying to focus on a set of issues that received a lot of attention in academia and in the industry at the time, in the US especially. Uh, and it's not that they are, don't receive that, uh, that much attention at the time, but I think attention has definitely um, shifted and yeah, turned into uh, different directions. So 
um, let me tell you um, what was going on at the time. It was the time of unity. Some of you, I think, are too young to remember this, but Pablo may remember uh, this unity, uh, this alliance of journalists um, of color. Um, at least at some point it was called like that. It brought together the Association of Black Journalists, of Hispanic Journalists, of Asian American and Native American Journalists, and at a later stage also the National Lesbian and Gay Journalist Association. Um, and this was a very active and, and, and um, prominent platform at the time among at least some journalists and some media. It was also the time of ASNE, the American Society of News Editors, now merged into NLA, um, and where the discussion in ASNE or a key discussion in ASNE was the uh, parity uh, project, which was meant to match the demographics or the goal was to match the demographics of the newsroom with the demographics of the community. And what I have here below the ASNE um, symbol, ASNE symbol, is the um, yeah sort of the core principle of this parity project the, the idea and i i'm citing here sorry the quotation marks are not there but it's a quotation from a statement from 1998 and it says so to cover communities fully to carry out their role in a democracy and to succeed in the marketplace the nation's newsrooms must reflect the racial diversity of American society by 2025. This was a moving target, of course, at some points it said earlier dates um, or sooner. At a minimum, all newspapers should employ journalists of color and every newspaper should reflect the diversity of its community. The newsroom must be a place in which all employees contribute their full potential regardless of regardless of race ethnicity color age gender sexual orientation physical ability or other defining characteristics so these were the times bringing you back to when yeah that was a um uh, discourse in san jose where i conducted my study uh it was the it was the golden age of the san jose mercury news I wonder whether, yeah, how, how, how much do you hear about this newspaper now um, living in the US? Um, but I'm sure it's not what it used to be. It was one of the flagship uh, newspapers of Night Reader, um, which, yeah, sort of bought, was bought by McClatchy in 2006. So, but these were the last golden days. Um, and at the time, the Merc, the Mercury News, had an extraordinary diversity record. It was it had one of the most diverse newsrooms in the country, um, and under the direction of the first African American publisher in publishers in a in a large metropolitan newspaper under Jay Harris, it had launched in the mid 1990s a Spanish and a Vietnamese language weekly. Two foreign language newspapers were a record for a newspaper company at the time, but it was not completely original. Um, especially the, the Spanish language newspapers were growing in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s. Um, actually, the number more than doubled between the 1990 and 2006. Um, so that that's what was going on in relation to sort of, uh, or part of what was going on, um, the news media um, and diversity in, in the area where I was. In the, in the, in, in scholarship, both, uh, well, like in the industry, um, there was quite some support for these kind of efforts. In general, uh, there was little, if any, criticism of Spanish language publications. They were seen as an attempt to serve all members of or or these kind of publications to serve all members of diverse communities by addressing them um, in their own language and according to their own interests. The idea of diversifying newsrooms to match demographics and the conviction that that would lead to more inclusive news coverage was not not questioned very much at the time there there was a little bit of criticism but not very prominent and 
actually most research in this area followed what I'm calling here an objectivist or representationalist uh, representationalist um, sort of model where uh, misrepresentation was a mismatch between um, the portrayal of minorities in the news and some kind of reality. Now, this reality were always official records, right? So there was a comparison between yeah, the numbers in the newsroom and official, official census data, or the number of people of color, um, a, a news about criminality among people of color with the statistics about criminality among people of colors, et cetera, right? So there was this idea that what good journalism had to do was to properly match reality. At a time when objectivity, of course, was already the focus of much criticism in journalism studies, right? But within this area of research, it it sort of was was not um, sufficiently taken into account. Um, now, from, from this perspective, from an objectivist perspective, uh, minority media would be good to the extent to which they followed objectivity and yeah, in journalism or the values and standards of mainstream journalism. So who controlled these media, Spanish language media, um, or other so-called, so-called, and we should question this, ethnic media, uh, was not really a question, right? It was from an objectivity perspective, uh, newspapers were doing their work if they were properly sort properly sort of reflecting some kind of reality um, out there. And this is also how the Mercury News talked about its Vietnamese and its Spanish language newspaper. Um, so that's that's how things were at the time and the kind of literature I encountered. Um, and I um, I, I, I didn't have a clear idea of what I wanted to study, but I thought I, I, this, is, this is something that could turn into my PhD research. Um, Facundo talked briefly about, he offered a generous quick bio of myself, um, but just as a reminder, right, I had moved from Santiago, from the journalism school of Santiago, where I had learned about the rules of proper professional journalism. Um, I had graduated from what what was considered at the time, and probably many still consider it, the best school of journalism in Chile. At a time when studying journalism in Chile was where, yeah, was was um, oh, yeah meant something I think slightly different to what it means before. This was right after the Pinochet dictatorship. And uh, yeah, journalism competed with I, almost medicine. I don't want to say that medicine for the best scores in the country. I had worked in this large metropolitan newspaper and I thought I knew what good journalism looked like, right? And now that I was becoming acquainted with the San Jose Mercury News and its Nuevo Mundo, I also became acquainted with local Latino, uh, Latina, Latinx newspapers in the area. And to be honest, they did not meet the standards I had sort of um, learned in journalism school and I sort of so firmly believed in. And yet I thought that they would be interesting. Um, it would be interesting to sort of get in touch with them, to learn about them, that, to figure out how this could turn into a research project. So one morning in the I don't know, it must have been 2003, 2004. I drove to San Jose to the offices of El Observador. And forgive me because I, yeah, these were not the times when we would be with a mobile phone taking pictures of everything. Um, so I don't have a visual documentation of this. I wouldn't have been able to, to take pictures anyway of my meeting. Um, my goal was to meet the publisher of El Observador, a local Latinx newspaper. Um, Gilberto Morales. I, I believe I did not have an appointment with him. Um, I, I was still very much a reporter with experience to find um, all kinds of people and just approach them and talk with them. And here I had to wait a little bit. 
And when I was finally offered a few minutes to talk with Mr. Morales, I told him who I was. I mentioned Stanford. I mentioned the San Jose Mercury News. Um, I asked about his paper and what I saw was real anger, anger and distrust. Why would he trust me? He asked if I was coming from Stanford. Why, how would he know if, if I was a spy from the San Jose Mercury News? Um, I remember these two questions. He said more and I remember that I left thinking I would never come back actually. I sat in the car and I cried and I thought, how can, I mean, with my experience, it was not that much, but I had talked with sort of powerful government officials and politicians as a reporter, and I had never left an interview crying. Now, this moment, um, I'm not telling you about this too, too, with any sense of self-pity. On the contrary, with a lot of, I'm very grateful, grateful with, with, uh, with uh, Mr. Morales and grateful with the very short uh, anthropology training that I had at the time, which sort of pushed me into, um, after, <laughs> after crying, to start thinking what was going on here? Where was he speaking from? Who did I represent? Who had he seen uh, in me? And what was I actually not seeing? What were my blind spots here? And actually that was for me, um, yeah, it forced me to take actors seriously, let's say, and it shaped the project in which I um, started working. In this project, what I did was to try to understand the relation between the Latinx community and the press in, in this local context of San Jose. Um, and the press implied the Mercury News, its Spanish language newspaper, but also El Observador from Mr. Morales and uh, La Oferta and, and other media that circulated in the, in the area. And so what I did was that I participated in the monthly meetings of an organization called La Raza Roundtable, which is sort of where, yeah, um, the most or many of the most politically involved Latino members of the community would, would meet every week. And it really was meant to um, engage with, with the interest and concerns of the Latino community. Uh, that's how I met most of the people I interviewed for this research uh, and with whom I spent some time. I, I, it's not that I was, um, I didn't move to San Jose, but I tried to spend some time with, with interviewees, um, even if the main source of data were the in-depth interviews with them. And I reviewed historical archives and news stories, especially those news stories that people told me about and yeah and I also interviewed people from the especially Latino reporters from the Mercury News so forced by Mr. Morales probably enlightened by my brief introduction to anthropology um, and the curiosity of yeah of a journalist I, I I went to talk with people and what I found was that the perspective of the Latino community in San Jose uh, did not match with the literature, right? For them, misrepresentation was something else. It was not that the statistics said something or the census said something and the newspaper was saying something else. It could not be what I wrote here, a quote from, from, from the time. Um, it could not be equated with a mismatch between news account and an objectively documented reality. And that also meant, for example, that um, it, for, for the members of the community, the labels that the San Jose Mercury News to identify who was a, Latino, a Latinx representative, for example, were not meaningful, right? The, the, the Mercury News needed an official credential saying that someone represented the community and the people in the community did not necessarily feel represented by the same people or not always by the same people, right? What the newspaper had to do forced to objectively decide who represents the interests of the community was um, reifying given structures of power, right? People with these certified credentials. So on the one hand, right, misrepresentation was a different problem, not the kind of problem that 
most of research sort of documented at the time and where mo much energy was spent, right? Com comparing reality with news coverage or uh, numbers, uh, census numbers with the distribution of jobs in the newsroom. That was one issue. And the other is that uh, the corporate production of uh, Spanish language newspapers like uh, Nuevo Mundo actually threatened uh, man minorities in general, in this case, the Latino communities own access to practice of representation. And, and Mr. Morales anger had to do with this, right? The, the Mercury News was trying to step on his market with with a formula that that did not really represent the interest of the community, at, le at least not from the perspective of Morales and not from the perspective of, of the other uh, people I interviewed either, including those not linked to any of the publications, so to audiences. Um, and 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 yeah, I'm not I'm not getting into details here, but also uh, yeah, when when the Mercury News or any other large metropolitan newspaper decides to take over or to compete in a market, of course the force with they compete with which they compete, the pressure they put on advertisements and advertisers is yeah makes uneven the field even even more, right? So. So this is an old but first case in which, yeah, these these importance of taking actors seriously to make a contribution to a body of literature became clear to me. I will um, I will now jump maybe I'll speed up into I will certainly uh, these are projects which are fresher in my mind. I don't have to say so much about it. Um, so this one is about news and poverty. And what this was, um, yeah, uh, half a decade ago, I think a little bit more that I started looking into the literature and the literature here, the state of the art, as I'm calling it, was pretty deterministic. News about poverty in general in the literature are uh, described as um, falling into the culture of poverty or blame the victim narrative, right? So the literature scholarship critiques news because of that, uh, critiques news because of being stigmatizing, business-driven, sensationalist, disregarding power structures, serving dominant interests. I don't think this is a surprise for anyone. Now, with respect to people living in poverty, uh, the only sort of possible um, uh, approach available in scholarship, right? If you want to uh, treat people uh, um, respectfully and properly, you need, or, or journalism should move, move from individualistic to structural explanations, right? That's the way in which you move away, in which you move from uh, uh, the culture of poverty, right, approach. So an emphasis on structure, criticizing appro individualistic approaches, or to use um, and these are relatively old, but still classic references in the field. So to cite Iyengar, to move from episodic to thematic coverage. This is this kind of coverage would be seen as the only appropriate um, way to deal with the topic. And the reason why journalists were not doing their work properly. And with respect to journalists in this literature, right, journalists, well, sometimes we're simply ignored. Most of the research continues to be uh, an analysis of texts where uh, the intentions and the actions of journalists are sometimes assumed. You every now and then you hear, um, you read about, yeah, a guess about why journalists would have done this. Um, but in more sociological approaches, actually journalists are interviewed but as the literature, as we know from crit uh, criticisms and downsides of the sociological approach, usually interviews, the goal of interviews or after interviews, the, the scholar comes and tells us what is really going on. And what is really going on is not what the journalist said. What is really going on is that journalistic action is, is shaped by norms, practices and routines. And I don't want to say that shape, uh, that norms, practices, and routines are unimportant. Um, but I do want to say that there is more than that. And my study 
in in an area at the sort of bottom of this page of this map between La Pintana and Puente Alto, so where the levels of poverty in an already very segregated and unequal city, which is Santiago, uh, so where the levels are um, among the lowest or the highest in terms of poverty. That's where I conducted a study um, trying to take actors seriously. Um, th that area is called Bajos de Mena. And I, at the time, I looked at the television news coverage of Bajos de Mena. Um, I have two pictures there to give credit to uh, Yvonne Peñailillo and Viviana Rojas, who are two of the, I don't remember exactly the name, of the uh, community leaders with whom I spent time in Bajos de Mena and whom I interviewed. And that's that logo there is, I had it here, um, they're, they're, uh, the logo of their movement. They had a um, a movement to improve living conditions in the area. So the movement is called, this is how I want to live, right? I want to live in a house with, well, a, a house like the one in the drawing. That was the idea. They were, they were asking the government to demolish, um, th these were public housing buildings, and, and, and uh, facilitate the conditions for residents to buy uh, a, a proper dignified housing or to um, or to have the, the the buildings restored and improved, etc. What I did here is that I looked into the news stories, but I also talked with the journalist who had produced the news stories and with um, with the, a number of of community leaders who appeared also in many of these news stories. And so I read these together. Uh, together, when I just read the stories, and maybe this is important, when I just watched the stories um, in, a, in the archive online, I got scared, and I and I I got scared about visiting Bajo de Mena, or at least I had to call journalist friends to ask them how is it to go to Bajo de Mena, um, and and I also thought the stories were sensationalist, stigmatizing and all those things that we knew from research. What I found in conducting the research is that, yes, the stories were like this, right? But they were not determined um, by economic constraints and power inequalities. Uh, they were limited by that, yes, but choices had been made by both journalists and people in poverty. And those choices had try to sort of push these stories to meet the interest and of, of both, of people in poverty, people living there, and journalists. And people in poverty were not victims of the situation. They, they uh, were very proud uh, that they had played an active role in keeping Bajo de Mena in the news. Um, and I look at the watch and I realize I don't have much time to tell you details, but they had them, they contacted journalists, they they um, organized their protest according to yeah, news coverage. Um, they produced cases when they knew that the press would come. And they also rejected participating or collaborated, collaborating with stories which they thought would not meet their interest or would take different angles. And journalists, yes, they were after stories that would sell, uh, but they were also after stories that were worth telling. So uh, they had to compromise, but they were happy to have the opportunity to use Bajo de Mena to talk about inequality, rage, and injustice, to talk about the need for change in Chile, um, yeah, and the, 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 the backyard of Chile's main cities, to mention some examples in these stories. So basically, taking uh, actors seriously in this case allowed, um, allowed to, well, it, it forced me to go back to sociology 101, I guess, right? And, and make um, uh, deal with structure and agency in, in more complex terms, not as one, um, not as a zero sum game, right? But as a, but as a dialectic relation where po uh, agency is always um, part of structure and structure always involves agency. And to conceive possibilities and to, to conceive and to identify in reality, actually, possibilities for variation and change, 
which seem to be precluded in the more deterministic accounts. I will move quickly to my last example, uh, a more recent one about mobile phones and forced uh, migration. You, um, you may remember, uh, maybe you are too young, some of the faces I saw, <laughs> but, but this, uh, this was, um, especially in Europe, it was very prominent in the news around, this is 2018, um, uh, stories like this, right? Um, I'll show you a few. So that is uh, in the independent, the site, right? You can also look at the images, mostly uh, men, right? Um, uh, I think I think one could reasonably assume coming from Syria um, with their cell phones, of course, and the headlines talking about the vital function of cell phones in their lives. So this was what was happening at the time. Um, as as Lyris and Ponsanesi have documented, right, or have argued, the appearance of digitally connected refugees at the time was perceived as incongruent with the ideas of sad and poor refugees fleeing from war and atrocities. And these were well-intended efforts to, um, to make people realize that a refugee could be well-connected, let's say, and still deserve our help. In, in the literature, the, the, the narrative at the time was very similar. Mobile phones were, soon, were seen as tools that refugees use free and willingly to address specific uh, and practical social needs. Um, and they were described as having not only many needs, but only needs. So the, 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 the term was usually, uh, the term used was usually precarity. And scholars talked about precarity of place, precarity of information, emotional precarity, and, and to any kind of precarity, the cell phone would, would appear as sort of the or a key solution. So there was this unquestioned desirability of uh, unlimited and free mobile connectivity for refugees. What, what can be considered a pretty utilitarian understanding of, of mobile phones for refugees. Um, so what what we did in this project here, I worked with a co-author. Um, we questioned this utilitarian strategy um, using we questioned it empirically. What is it not allowing us to see by looking into existing data? There were some authors who had not all of them had really delved on it, but they had mentioned cases where refugees were not so comfortable with being connected or were developing strategies to change their kind of connection um, or there was a burden or a stress of, of, of being connected. And we conducted a small um, study interviewing 10 Syrian refugee men in the Netherlands as well. And I don't think I'll have time to talk about gender now. I'm hoping we'll have time to talk about it in a few questions. And we questioned this also um, theoretically, politically, the politics of this. Um, and so, am I skipping? And so, um, what what we what we found was that indeed the 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 relation of refugees with mobile phone was much more complicated. Uh, people saying, "Yeah, I, I I don't want to be listening to be always available to be listening to the dramas back home, especially given that I cannot do any time." But disconnecting was impossible, for example. So discomfort and the pressure to be connected. And in the Netherlands, um, the, the technocratic relation, the technocentric relations they had, right? The, the cell phones enabled them to have many relations, but not the kind of relations they wanted to have, and somehow reproduced social divides. Politically, what we saw um by by paying actors by paying attention to actors taking actors seriously but also by reading those who have done that is that there was a, a process of othering in this uh, uh utilitarian narrative um so th the literature on non-migrant connectivity told 
pretty different and much more complex stories, right, than migrant connectivity. That was the first sign that things were not going well. And, and what we saw here was the, the, the humanitarian discourse um, or, or characteristics of the humanitarian discourse that have been uh, criticized elsewhere, elsewhere being reproduced here, right? So um, uh, refugees as just need spare humanity and, and appealing to audiences for their compassion instead of uh, defending the political rights of, of refugees. Um, yeah, I'll jump quickly to my last slide, right? Um, uh, so I really believe, um, and again, this is not new or original, but there's still more room to continue doing that, right? That taking actors seriously um, allows us to counter othering and dehumanizing discourses in the media, in society, in academia as well and allows us, and again, at least me, from a privileged position to undo, to try to address some of my blind spots. Because, yeah, it's not about undoing bad intentions. I, most of the examples I've given are probably very well intended. And my blind spots, I want to think, are also well intended, right? But it's not about, about uh, yeah, improving intentions, having good intentions, but it's about, yeah, um, uncovering these blind spots. And the last point I, I, I pointed there was, um, it's a reference to um, an author that has been really useful for me to think about my own, oh, there, um, my own um, changes in mind. There's this author, a science fiction feminist um, uh, writer from the 60s, the 70s, Ursula Le Guin, who um, in a new uh, edition of a book a question asks whether she should correct things or not because if she corrected expressions from her previous writings there were many things she would do differently and yet she decides that she will not do this and instead she will um, include comments on the old text, let's say. She says, it doesn't seem right or wise to revise an old text severely, as if trying to obliterate it, hiding the evidence that one had to go there to get here. It is rather in the feminist mode to let, one, uh, to let one's changes of mind and the process of change stand as evidence, and perhaps to remind people, and I to remind myself, that minds that don't change are like clams that don't open. And I mentioned this because I think that, yeah, trying to take uh, actors seriously helps us um, keep opening our minds, but also deal generously with the mistakes and with the change of minds that we have had uh, through or we have through the years. And with that, I will close and stop sharing. Pretty late, sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Isabel. This was a wonderful and very important presentation. Thank you again for sharing uh, with us your uh, reflections and thoughts uh, of your uh, very inspiring career. Um, I would like in, to encourage the audience to include, uh, to ask questions using the Q&A uh, button uh, in the Zoom screen, in the bottom of the screen. But I would like to, to start with my question first. Um, it is uh, very common, particularly in sociology and anthropology, to see uh, scholars uh, writing systematically about um, issues of positionality, um, um, yeah, reflexivity, representation, some of the issues you, you, you share and you reflect with us today. Uh, but to my knowledge, it's not that common that in, in uh, journals in communication and media study to see uh, scholars reflecting the same way, like uh, like using particular ethnography and, all, and other qualitative methods on on the importance of these issues uh, within our field, within the field of communication. Um, how how do you see this uh, in our community, in the, in the communication and media studies community? Uh, how do you see the uh, the reflexivity that you uh, incredibly share with us today? Um, uh, and, and in which place this 
conversation should take place is it like in this space like in the in the space where we are today like uh uh like in the center uh is it should be like also we should be like systematizing all these uh issues uh in journals uh should be conferences i don't know uh, i would like to hear your thoughts on that thank you I, I agree with you. I think that it's it's common um, when I when I use some of these examples in class. Um, every now and then, a student says, "But you did not discuss that in the paper, right?" And uh, and I yeah, I don't think there is, and um, and I should try it more. But there is much space in our more traditional journals to uh, spend much time on on these on these issues. It always sort of remains backstage. I think that in our teaching, in our in in our methods books and in our methods classes, at least within certain areas of media studies, we talk we talk about it, but it does not get yeah um, uh, published at least. And and I well, so I always I always say I'm a want to be anthropologist, and uh, and I really if I if, well I don't know. Uh, if I could, um, and there, of course, I really enjoy and I learn from from these spaces in publications, right, where there's much more self reflection. Um, yeah. I don't, I think that uh, thank you. Be an interesting uh, yes, I, I think that. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I think that uh, Val has a question. Yes, thank you so much for such an interesting and very important presentation, Professor Awad. I have two questions for you. My first question is around the notion of misrepresentation that you put forth at the beginning of your presentation. And I was wondering if you can elaborate a bit more on your own process to conceptualize misrepresentation, especially as you mentioned, how previous literature explores this notion by comparing census data against uh, representations in newspapers. And my second question is around the notion of balancing stories that sell and stories that are worth telling, especially as journalists engage in discussions of inequality, race, and injustices that are so important to discuss, especially um, within these fields. And I was wondering if you can elaborate a bit more about how you saw this tension emerging in your field work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Two big questions, I think. So, um, um, yeah, when when I worked well, so the, the mimetic view of representation, right, is that there's a reality out there and that we can mirror it. And this has been criticized so much in journalism. And yet I think that it still yeah, has not fully synced in, at least in some discussions and some areas. Right. Um, and so, yeah, we know or at least many of us assume right and are convinced about the fact that we cannot access that reality what all we have are representations of that reality including census data where for example categories need to be made right and some people it depends on the country and maybe it works perfectly in the us but usually there are some groups who participate less or there are some there are biases that are reproduced in this so-called official reality not to talk about police records of criminality right and here the us would also be a great example right what does it mean to match polit <laughs> police records of criminality with racial um sort of representation on the newspaper so uh, here i would really take um take actors seriously and i would ask you actually when do you feel misrepresented, right? And most probably it will not be when the picture that I have is not, right? But when when you feel you have been treated unfair, when you feel that you have not been listened to, um, right? When you have not been able to contribute to that representation, to have a say. And here I think it's always very useful to think about political representation and aesthetic representation, right? It's the same word and for good reasons. We need representatives and we those are not delegates that automatically act, right? As if there was a perfect formula to represent constituents, but they need to, if they are good representatives, if they are properly representing us, they are in a close contact and connection and listening to our needs, our interests in that dialogue, right? Um, so I think that that's a, that's a, yeah, to me, that has been analytically useful to keep in mind when talking about representation. 
Um, and the question about um, journalists sort of negotiating between commercial and other kinds of constraints. Well, so I have a big advantage here, which I did not fully mention, but it's in my CV, which is that I studied journalism and some of my best friends are journalists. So I read this literature and I'm also a critical journalist, but I know these people and they are brilliant people and they are socially uh, committed and concerned people, right? So how do we make sense of this? One, one possibility is to sort of ignore them and just <laughs> look at the text. But if these, they are talking through you and say, but how, does, how can this be possible if I know them, right? Um, and then you talk with them and you realize, which is what I did, especially in this case, it's very clear, the case of Bajos de Mena, is to realize that the, the options they had were not infinite. They could have written another story about the best pizza in, ta in town or the last sneakers. And these were 10 minute stories. And I didn't have the time to talk about what was happening in the news in Chile. But these were 10 minute long stories about the last sneaker in the market. And they said, and I convinced my editor that instead I would get as much rating talking about Bajos de Mena. And, I, and that allowed me to, to really talk about injustice, inequality. Yes, it was sensationalist at some point. I kept the rating sort of up, but I really brought this into the agenda. And if you have seen the developments in Chile, I'm very hopeful, um, in the last decade, this may, I mean, it makes sense for everyone, not only people in poverty, but also journalists at the time to be pushing for substantial reforms against structures of power, but having to keep a job within those structures. Uh, I think that Mora has a question. I do. Uh, thank you so much, Isabel, for this uh, wonderful ref self-reflective ref reflective, uh, presentation that's very much needed uh, for the community and for us in this virtual seminar series. And also, yes, just wonderful to hear self-reflections on how we think of ourselves as Latin American scholars or Latinx scholars. Uh, I have um, two questions in relation to the third part of your presentation about this connection and immigrants. Um, my first question is perhaps more of a commentary, but I would love to hear your thoughts on this. And this is that um, for the past, I would say perhaps six years or five years, there's been a lot of conversations around uh, voluntary digital disconnection. And uh, interestingly enough, these are conversations that emerge from very wealthy parts of the world, right? Um, and so these are conversations that want to ask why people feel the need to disconnect from these permanent connectivity demands. And it's so interesting uh, to realize based on your findings that actually not only connection can be thought of in terms of a privilege, but actually also disconnection can be thought in, term, in terms of a privilege. So I wonder what are your insights on this? Like, this is my first question. And then my second question as someone studying disconnection practices, uh, I want to ask what are some of your advice for taking actors seriously when it comes to studying voluntary digital disconnection? Thank you so much. Thank you, Mona. Um, yeah, I fully agree with you. Disconnection is a privilege. I think it, it makes sense. I mean, as a mother of two small children, when I'm able to disconnect, I really feel right. I really feel or or and right when you are free from the obligations that keep you checking whether there is an emergency or you need to take action or whatever. It's a privilege. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's that's definitely the point. What I what I find really in what we found really interesting in, in, in looking at the literature on forced migration and refugees um was yeah on the one hand of course they did not have this privilege but also the will for disconnection was not acknowledged it was sort of assumed that because they are only a bag of needs if you are a smart refugee you are always connected right and that was the argument used to basically defend their connectivity and what maybe they had the latest or that's how the memes went right the latest mobile phone so the real problem there was it's interesting that, of course, they would also want to disconnect, right? And that would be a privilege that maybe they don't have. But the divide between the literature on normal people and the literature on forced refugees, right, where one was always connected if they were smart, and the other would sometimes want to be connected, sometimes not, sometimes 
watch porn or play a game sometimes or sometimes do important stuff right no for refugees really mobile phones were uh breathing were oxygen were water that's what it was and that was a strategic decision of course and very well intended i think but the risk the downside was reducing them and you talk about how to connect yeah talk with people spend time with people i don't know just i and and, and always but i think we do this but always thinking would I also do that? How would it be? Am I othering the other person or can I place myself in that position? Is that really the case? There was a great um, um, ICA um, presentation for some of you who were in ICA. There was a panel about the big elephant in the room uh, towards the end of the panel. And it was about authoritarian, the role of the space for authoritarian regimes and scholars from authoritarian regimes in these kind of conferences. And someone I really admire, I, I'll cite here Cherry and George from Singapore and from Hong Kong, now he lives in Hong Kong, talked about how um, what, we, what we don't want, or one of the things we don't want, is to be treated as, yeah, those strange, those, those people tolerate them, they like authoritarianism, they like to be forced to doing things, they, they don't really enjoy, this sense of tolerance, right, that, yeah, they are, they, yeah, these people like it, so let's be tolerant with them and welcome them, right, as opposed to understanding that, yeah, they are as humans as we are, there may be cultural differences, there may, but human beings, right share humanity and sometimes we run the risk of denying part of that humanity on that wonderful closing uh, note i want to thank isabel for a truly enlightening seminar i uh, want to thank facundo for his always wonderful moderation and a special thanks to mora who uh, after this uh, seminar number 60 of the Center for Latinx Digital Media will conclude her duties as coordinator of the center and moving to the fellowship stage of her dissertation. And uh, Mora has been a totally instrumental part of the launching of the center, the making everything work very smoothly. Without her, uh, none of what we do would be possible. So Mora, thanks a lot, very, very specially. Uh, for you. Thanks, Isabel, again uh, for a wonderful seminar. Thanks to our audience for staying with us through the end. Uh, this is the last seminar of the current academic year, so we will hope to see you again on September 22nd uh, for our first seminar in the fall. We'll announce the lineup in the next couple of weeks. In the meantime, I wish everybody a great uh, summer, those in the Northern Hemisphere, those in the Southern Hemisphere, a great winter. Bye now.